Well, hello YouTube, it's me Fortmaster, and welcome back to another Overly Sarcastic Productions reaction and Trope Talk Tone Armor. Now, this is something I haven't heard of before, but just given the fact that it's Tone Armor, I'm going to guess maybe it's somewhere along the same lines as Plot Armor, but it's more in line to, the, to a story's actual tone. Like, I would imagine where you have a character that is in a world that is otherwise like really gritty and harsh and, uh, and you know grim dark i believe could be a good way of saying it um but they're otherwise like very happy silly kooky you know that sort of thing um while not being affected by the world around them at large um at least that's what i think i haven't looked in the description at all though the thumbnail did involve daffy duck and elmer fudd so uh maybe it has something to do with them i don't really know <laughs> But I always love Red's Trope Talks, and uh, I'm very excited to see what this one's going to be about. So, as always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the Day. And if you like the stuff that I put out, whether it's gameplay or reactions, I would love it if you could just take a second to subscribe to my channel. It would mean the absolute world to me. The button even lights up when I say subscribe. So with all that out of the way, let's get this thing started then, shall we? If you've ever engaged with the literary criticism space in any sort of action-heavy genres, you've probably heard the term plot armor. Plot armor is a phenomenon yeah, where yeah, characters' definitely. narrative importance and centralization in the plot provides them with a sometimes implausible level of protection against things that would easily maim or kill a side character. Plot armor might let a main character walk off anything from a bullet to a building exploding, because the purpose of these threats in story is not to kill the protagonist, it's to challenge them. To Though, uh, the imperviousness of that plot armor um, i.e. how much damage it does let through before said damage becomes lethal is always up for tweaking uh, by the author. I've seen plot armor that, um, I've seen more than a few shows and stuff where the plot armor, um, wasn't that impervious even if it did do its job. <laughs> increase the tension and or leave them vulnerable in interesting ways. Essentially, it doesn't matter how realistically deadly or damaging a hit should be, if they're a main character who needs to continue participating in the plot, they're not gonna get one-shotted. And plot armor doesn't just keep characters alive, it also keeps them active so they can continue to participate in the in story, the story and yeah. along. Even a non-lethal injury can dramatically slow the plot down, and there's a difference between a protagonist staggering out of a car crash with a limp and a protagonist spending two months recovering in a hospital and then another six weeks in physical therapy. <laughs> plot armor oh, yeah. mostly gets focused when it's being called out as a problem or a symptom of weak writing, but it's basically just a facet of suspension of disbelief, where the audience is expected to understand that a story randomly killing off a main character on whom much of the plot is dependent will probably severely impact that story's effectiveness. Actually, what was it? I remember somebody posted before this idea of like a show or a story or something where the show starts off with like one character, maybe like have it like set up almost like a D&D campaign where you have a group of people. But as the show goes on, uh, they keep getting new people on and older people get killed off. So by the end of the show, the cast of characters that is currently on the show is completely different and in no way related to the people who actually started the show. And the, granted, I something like that, you would have to handle very carefully to see if like, you know, to actually make it good. But I would love to see somebody actually try that in a story and just to see how it would actually play out. Like, would they somehow, would it just be like the, the newer people keeping the older people's quest going because, you know, they were brought into the group and that's what the group was already doing. So they just continued it. Or would the plot literally like make right turns as like the actual like cast uh, members and like character list, like just would literally change almost like fundamentally every few episodes. When we suspend our disbelief, we accept that sometimes the story makes the plot better by doing things that don't 100% make sense. But yeah. plot armor isn't the only factor that shapes how resilient the characters are. After all, plot armor is for important characters only and does absolutely nothing to protect side characters, background extras, a main character's beloved extended family, etc. But even without the protection of plot armor, background characters in one story might walk off the kind of damage that would have fully exploded them in another. In one story, it might be unthinkable to ever see visible blood, while in another, it might be impossible for a 
character to get through a grocery trip without getting doused in three pints of the stuff. This is a phenomenon is that, that I so sad to tone armor. Through every genre and every form of media, every story sets a tone. Now, tone is okay, a yeah. deceptively massive concept influenced by a ton of factors, and because it's basically another word for vibes, we're not going to be able to nail down a rigid set of rules for defining it. You know, for some reason, I feel like this video would be a lot different if the, if the title was called Vibe Armor. It's shaped by the feel of the dialogue, the emotional range of the characters, the density of jokes, the musical score, the ambient lighting and color grading, the statements it makes on human nature, the character choices it rewards or punishes. The tone of the story is the sum of a massive number of parts. In a way, it's kind of like the temperature of a room. A lot of factors are influencing it, but you're basically only going to notice it if it makes you uncomfortable or if it's changing rapidly. And the thing is, the tone okay. of a story does fluctuate, sometimes significantly. Some stories get progressively more mature and dark over time. Dragon Some Ball, right. Episodic, disconnected adventures to overarching grand scale threats. Many games let their narrative stakes escalate alongside the protagonist's power scale. <laughs> oh god, shows yeah. Have notably dark episodes that are memorably scarring. And there's a whole set of tropes based around a story hitting unexpectedly hard by taking a turn that's outside the current scope of the expected. Wait, Cerberus Syndrome? When a story starts out lights and gets serious, Knights of Cerberus, characters whose introduction heralds a dark tone shift, Cerberus callback, something light and funny is referenced in a new unhappy context. Cerberus Ratcon, something we thought was light and funny, is retconned to be tragic. Oh, okay, yeah. So basically, the entirety of like a lot of cartoons from like 2010s to onward, so like Adventure Time, Steven Universe, would you, Gravity Falls? Would Gravity Falls fall under that umbrella? Because... No, I mean they set up in the very first episode, like like the the books and the and the weird authors and stuff like that. And also, you know, Uncle Stan going in the basement behind like the, the vending machine. Huh. Oh, and then also there was Owl House as well. That's a newer uh, version of that. And I, I'd have to commit more time to see if I could remember any other shows because those are like the ones that initially come to mind for me tone. If you want to look into some of those tropes, a lot of them are bundled under the Cerebus Syndrome umbrella, which describes stories that establish a relatively lighthearted tone and then take an unexpected turn into extremely dark directions. It's rare for stories to go the other way, except in the sense that dark stories can have happy endings, but I'm sure it's happened somewhere. The thing is, deviating from a story's established tone is a powerful tool. If a story never shows blood, even a single visible drop can be immensely impactful. But in order to get the power yeah, from breaking of breaking those rules, the rules need to be solidly established first. And with something as vibes-based as tone, those rules are set down subtly. The tone of the story gives the audience an expected range of what kinds of things can or can't happen. Of course, that moves around. From good will always triumph in the end and heroic intentions will be rewarded because this is a story about good people being vindicated, to just whether or not characters can swear more than once a movie. The tone <laughs> of the story is kind of a soft-edged probability map of what kinds of things can be expected to happen in the story versus what kinds of things are quite unlikely. In classic heroic fantasy, the tone makes things Things like the good rings. guys win in the end, fairly likely, and protagonist randomly takes an arrow to the face halfway through, rather unlikely. In a zombie apocalypse, the tone makes a happy ending for all main characters catastrophically unlikely, but it's also pretty unlikely that the main character is going to die to anything other than a zombie bite, since the tone typically centralizes that as the core of the underlying horror, and anything else would be almost a letdown. Although, I mean, I, I, she's probably going to get into it. I've watched way more Walking Dead than I've ever wanted to, purely because like my little brother is a fan and he was a fan for years it's only now that he started to peter off on it it's because they keep pumping out so many new like um like uh, so many new shows but i mean of course you have like characters that like die and then become zombies you had a cup i think like you've had a couple of side characters who like died due to zombies but i swear like 90 percent of the deaths in the in that show are like from people being killed by other people. <laughs> so, if it's a zombie apocalypse where the tone is more broadly nihilistic, the main characters can theoretically die from anything, since meaningless random cruelty serves the tone. Yeah. If anything, the most unlikely outcome in a zombie apocalypse is anyone behaving like a decent human being. In an episode of Scooby-Doo, the tone forecast suggests a surfeit of wa- Yeah, again, that whole thing. I just, that is part of the reason that I do not watch zombie things, like, at all. It is just, they're so depressing. <laughs> 
It is so boring to watch because you know everybody's just going to suck. Wacky shenanigans and traps, but it's very unlikely that we're going to see Shaggy throw out his back from carrying a 140 pound Great Dane. Realistically, <laughs> none of these unlikely events are actually impossible. They just don't. Actually, fit it is the funny. You never think of how big Scooby Doo actually is. From them, a kind of armor that they acquire from the tone. A story that takes a comedic, cartoony tone will likely play fast and loose with the laws of physics. Uh, and of the course, here's where Donald and Daffy Duck absurd. comes in. A character face to face with a bomb will be reduced to an ash pile with two blinking eyes. A character that gets shot with a gun will have their duck bill cartoonishly spin around their face. A character careening <laughs> off a cliff will explode and then be back one scene later. In this established tonal context, it would be extremely jarring for a character to get hit with a mallet and consequently be hospitalized with a brain injury, or even for a character to get a paper cut and visibly bleed. The tone of the story yeah. doesn't allow for it. This is tone armor. Actually, thinking about it, isn't that sort of, that's sort of one of the things about that in, in like Who Framed Rob? Roger Rabbit, isn't it? Because like you have, you know, cartoon characters who can't be killed unless they're like subjected to the dip, which I think is just like, um, oh god, what was it? it? Was like it was like paint thinner or something? You know, stuff that was used specifically to clear off ink on like on those like this on the on the cells. But like they're virtually indestructible, and yet they can sub and yet they can subjugate us human beings to those exact same things, and we die you know, in rather predictable ways. I mean, Eddie Valiant's brother, he died because because uh, a tune, <laughs> Judge Doom, um, ended up dropping a, uh, wait, was it a piano or, a, no, it was a piano on his head, not a safe. The safe happens to, a, happens to a different character off screen later in the movie. The set of assumptions and standards that a story's tone establishes specifically in the context of endangering the characters. Despite what the cartoonish example might imply, tone armor is not actually a case of more realism equals darker story equals nastier injuries. For one thing, humans in real life are deceptively durable and capable of surviving some pretty bananas things, but... Uh, yeah, um, the first thing that comes to my mind, the story of the woman who fell out of a plane from like 20,000 feet and survived because she crashed through several trees. But in, for example, sword and sorcery fantasy, the heroes might swing their way through an army of minions and take them all down permanently with one sword stroke or light stab each. This is a combo of plot and tone armor, where the bad guy's status as faceless side characters affords them negative plot armor and lets a stiff breeze knock them over for convenience of pacing. But God, I never even thought of it like I'm having negative arm, having like negative plot armor or tone armor in this case. I mean, I've never thought of that. I guess that does. I guess that is kind of like a mirror to the whole thing of like what was it, square root of ninjutsu or something, or however that tone works. Where the more like of uh, the more ninjas you have in one place, the worse they're all going to fight. But as soon as you get down to one, he's going to be like a uh, master or something. But it's also tone armor, because a hero bloodlessly dancing their way through an army of goons is quick and clean and exciting to watch, and it spares us from watching any slow or icky consequences to that kind of combat. We don't see those stricken minions slowly and horrifically die in a field hospital like we'd expect from the tone of a tragic war movie, and yeah. we also don't typically see half of those minions stand up again with minor scratches on their sturdy leather armor ready for another go like we might expect from the real <laughs> life. In this case, tone armor dictates that <laughs> faceless minions basically get one hit point each, and when they're hit, they're cleanly down forever <laughs> i love the mental picture of like a minion being knighted or the equivalent by their evil master and just as soon as the blade touches their shoulder they just die <laughs> which is not innately realistic. It just makes for good fight choreography and it adheres to the heroic fantasy tone. Tone armor is largely defined by the preferences of the writer and the kind of story but, yes, they want to tell, but absolutely. sometimes it's also affected by outside factors, one of I, which is Mabel? intended audience. The younger an audience for a story, the less likely that story is to expose its audience to certain kinds of danger or injury. It's not seen as appropriate. And while plenty of kids are super down to I, murder, yes. certain kinds of body horror can stick with you if you aren't prepared for them, so they get glossed over or kept off screen or replaced with a more black explosion variant of the threat. Also, lots of stories for younger audiences skew more comedic, and in the interests of tonal consistency, if you're aiming for haha -ha comedy fun times, you probably don't want to interrupt the good times too much with. Vi I didn't even think of Centaur World. Well, granted, that's because I didn't really watch it because I I didn't really get into it. But still, what is?
is this show with the little liz lizard guy? Visceral unpleasantness. Cartoon violence doesn't tend to overlap with haunting violence. There's also intended audience factors that have almost nothing to do with age and everything to do with genre. For instance, if you're writing some sort of romance, the only injury a character can likely expect is the kind that artfully lays them up in bed so their love interest can care for them without any messy side effects or complications. In of this course. case, tone armor will keep the characters whole and pretty no matter what kind of horrible things they're going through because being pretty is kind of foundational to the genre and to the appeal to its audience. The other big outside yeah. factor that can affect tone armor is standards and practices. A lot of stories are affected by right. the presence of a distributor or an editor looking over the creator's shoulder and telling them things like, you can't show that on television. It's a form of moderate to severe censorship that is the trade-off many stories make in exchange for widespread distribution, and it very commonly manifests in hard limitations placed on the story's tone. For instance, it's very common for kids' TV shows to shy away from blood, which means characters might end a fight covered in anime scuff marks or bleed an unusual color to take the edge off or only ever fight robots that bleed robot juice. In yeah. In some cases, standards and practices might shy away from acknowledging death at all. This was weirdly common in 90s to 2000s anime dubs that had to take the source material and make it appropriate for an American Saturday morning time slot, which led to things like Yu-Gi-Oh's Shadow Realm, which I was literally just about to say that. I, the Shadow Realm. Oh, God, I remember that. Exists in the original, but gets much less screen time because pretty much any time a character is in danger of being sent to the Shadow Realm in the dub, it's because the actual stakes were death. Death is not okay, but a horrifying death like Hell Dimension is totes kid friendly. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, that makes total sense, doesn't it? Like, yes, that's objectively hilarious logic, but it's a form of tone armor that has a legitimate impact on how the story feels. Replacing buzz saws with dark energy discs that send you to the Shadow Realm if they touch you is very funny and very stupid, and I feel so bad for the team that had to paint over all those buzz saws and also erase my Valentine's cleavage in every shot, but it establishes boundaries on the story. Oh god. The cleavage center step. Why? Story's tone that the standards and practices people thought were more in line with a Saturday morning time slot for kids. The lower bound on the tone is having your soul sent to a nightmare dimension where you would probably not have a good time but could potentially be rescued. It is not having your legs sliced off by a saw trap. Considerations like this are all in service to keeping the tone light, although some forms of censorship backfire and they frequently diminish the impact of parts of the story that are actually supposed to be notably dark. I don't yeah. want to keep beating up on Yu-Gi-Oh, but season four, the evil bikers from Atlantis and objectively the best season featured villain characters with Evil backstories like entire Atlantis. family died in a shipwreck and war orphan with dead little brother and the dub kind of had to work overtime to change those to dude who got shipwrecked all by himself and turned his back on his family and little brother got kidnapped by a tank which makes the part at the end where they're heartwarmingly reunited with the ghosts of their dead families kind of a giant confusing plot hole when a writer wants to write a story oh, with God. deadly stakes but is forced to adhere to a tone armor paradigm that refuses to even acknowledge the existence of death the story can suffer and the characters might end up getting threatened with something that's even worse but technically pg tone armor is an invisible paradigm established oh north american censorship that's yeah it, te technically worse but still pg that's ju that's just you know <laughs> That's the whole theme of it, isn't it? Long as the blood isn't red. Established by a story that quietly teaches the audience what level of danger and brutality they can expect from the story. Most of the time, you will only think about tone armor when you see it break. And tone armor can break. In fact, breaking tone armor is one of the easiest ways to gut punch the audience because it oh, hits them yeah. in a way they didn't realize they could be hit. One of the most common and powerful ways tone armor can be broken is probably pretty obvious because it's also a breaking Major plot character armor, death, killing yeah. a main character. Before a main <laughs> character Happen? The tone of the story passively indicates that this is impossible. Main characters are protected from danger by plot armor and general narrative importance. Death might not even be a concept in this story, except as a vague implied threat if the heroes fail to save the day, which they won't. And then something happens. Maybe they Someone hit a scene dies. finale and have to do a boss rush to get to the final battle, and the big guy takes a hit and doesn't get back up. Maybe the new bad guy is such bad news that they straight up murder someone just to prove they can. Maybe the power-up that always saves the day gets cut off mid-theme music when the hero gets fully backstabbed. Something happens that has never happened before, and it changes the game. When a main character is built up for the express purpose of killing them off to show the stakes, this character is called a sacrificial lion. And despite their appearance as a standard main character, most of these characters are constructed specifically to die. It's just a matter of how well the writer can conceal this fact before the point of impact. And the th thing is, while this is usually used to expand the lower bound of the story's tone and make it feel like anyone can die, it doesn't usually mean that anyone can actually 
eventually permanently die now. Because yeah. again, plot armor exists for a reason. There was this really funny trend, it was funny to me anyway, in like the early 2010s where every popular show that was hitting the market was selling itself on the premise that anyone could die. Oh, Attack man, on must... Titan, Game of Thrones, The Walking Dead. I distinctly remember all these shows getting pitched as these dark, serious stories where being the main character wouldn't save you and that's what made it cool. And they all- and yet you have all these shows that went on for years and then none of the main characters ever actually died. <laughs> I mean, gr granted, Walking Dead was sort of the least of that because, you know, a lot of characters either died or went on to other shows or whatever. We'll have a moment where someone central and important dies to prove that that's a thing that can happen. But the thing is, a story where anyone can actually die is a story where a lot of threads are going to go unresolved, which is a bad story. A completely story. unresolved like, subplot. Like, if it leaves too many plot threads dangling, it's bad at being a story. So most of these stories end up outfitting their leads with a nice set of plot armor after a season or two, which I remember disappointing the people who'd been pitching them as dark, badass, anyone can die narratives but like that doesn't mean this form of breaking tone armor doesn't have an impact it reshapes yeah. the feel of the world by proving that being central to the plot is not enough to protect a character before we see it happen we don't believe it can happen there are other ways tone armor can be broken without necessarily killing anyone for instance sometimes the tone of the story is secretly being carried by one character <laughs> what do you mean everything's on fire one ridiculously overpowered protagonist who single-handedly makes the threats they deal with look easy, one very skilled and smart hero who keeps their villainous rival in check, one character who keeps the tone light. And then the story gets rid of them. Maybe they're dead, maybe they're missing, maybe they're just yeeted out of the story for a while. Whatever happens, they aren't around to help anymore, and the rest of the characters have to deal with the stakes they leave behind. It turns out this character was doing a lot to keep things manageable, and without them essentially shielding the rest of the story, the dark parts of the plot get a lot darker. They do this in the Helsing OVAs, where Alucard is such a hilariously overpowered nightmare that in order to make the villains actually threatening, they lure him out and stick him on a boat for half the series, and while he's stuck on the boat, nearly everybody else dies when London is blitzkrieged by Nazi vampires. It's not the first time Nazi anyone dies in the show, but right. it's the first time Ugh. main characters end up in actual serious danger because they don't have their pocket eldritch abomination around to save the day. They also do this in ba -da -ba Reboot Season 3! As if I would get through this video without highlighting the tonal downturn that defined my childhood. The first oh, two no. seasons of Reboot are goofy- No. <laughs> Reboot, no. Oh, I am- <sighs> Oh god, I missed Reboot. Oh. No. You know, I, I was a bit confused when she said Reboot Season 3. Uh, I had several things going in my mind. But it all makes sense. So, of course she's gonna go into it, but uh, my whole thing with Reboot that I am still angry about today is that the show ended on a cliffhanger. And you know what? It made it even worse. The show, well, the story I should say, did continue in like a webcomic. But the thing is, I only found that out years later, and nowadays, I can't find that webcomic anywhere. <laughs> so, I, it, it, and I, and I refuse to f find out what the ending of Reboot was by reading like a wiki or something. It shall forever be a scar on my soul. Mostly wacky episodic adventures with the occasional tonal whiplash in the form of a season finale or unusually devastating scheme from the main villains. Yeah. Then at the end of season two, trickster paragon protagonist Bob gets bundled into a rocket and fired into space, or rather the computer equivalent of space, the web, which is worse than space because it has Twitter in it. And <laughs> without Bob, Things get bad. Kid protagonist Enzo does his best to live up to his hero's example in single-handedly holding off these suddenly much bigger and scarier threats, and despite being a little kid and not a trained badass antiviral program, he holds it together decently well for a few episodes until he gets stuck in a Mortal Kombat game and loses his fucking eye in a show where the previous worst fate a hero could experience was a bad haircut. Things only get worse from there, with the kid heroes getting time skip training montaged into grown-ups while trapped in the games, and back home sees the destruction right. of basically every other iconic location from the first two seasons and the near total victory of the big bad. And what makes this form of tone armor breakage work most effectively is that when the vanished shield character returns, things start getting good again. These characters are such powerful forces that they just make things better around them. And when the heroes find them or save them or they just make it back on their own, everything starts getting better in a way that didn't seem possible when they were gone. The tone of the story follows them. When they're gone, the villains can run rampant, but when they're around, the story can have a happy ending. And honestly, this is a remarkably 
effective way to make an otherwise kind of basic protagonist very impactful. If their presence in the story is what keeps the other characters totally safe, load if their is what makes the story dip into tonal darkness that otherwise never happens, it's a very solid way to show don't tell how truly effective they are and how much they're doing for the story. One I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm, my mind's just stuck on Reboot right now. And what was his name? What, Lorenzo? Was that the kid's name? I'm forgetting. It's been so long since I've watched that show. But any, after, but anyway, after the time skip, because you know this, I am going to be going into spoilers here. But the show's how many years old, so I don't care. Uh, they fix the city by go, uh, by reloading it from a backup. Then you have I st I still love this. You have two copies of the same character. You have the grown up version of the kid who lost his eye and went through all these years of hardship and all this. And then you have the original kid, <laughs> with, like before any of this happened. It was so weird. <laughs> One sneaky aspect of tone armor is that a lot of stories will threaten stakes that they would never actually pay off. This is extremely worst common case, in yeah. sort of action setting where the implicit threat of main character death hangs over pretty much every combat encounter. Mission Impossible, yeah. Where the villain's machinations threaten the end of the world as we know it. And while these are theoretical elements of the tone of the world because the story acknowledges them as possibilities, unlike, for instance, stories where death is not even acknowledged as a thing that can happen, they're kind of in a state of plausibility flux. The story mm. recognizes that they are real threats, but never actually actually brings them into reality, so the audience doesn't necessarily buy them as part of the tone. A superhero story will threaten the apocalypse, but the mere existence of superheroes forestalls it from ever hitting, or in the worst case scenario, lasting longer than a week. In these <laughs> cases, tone armor can be cracked with temporary forays into what-if scenarios, or more commonly, in-season finales or big crossover arcs, which yeah. is usually when the threats are allowed to get more present and real, and the heroes switch from apocalypse prevention to apocalypse repair. These are odd little stakes cul-de-sacs, where the story briefly gets a lot more perilous, but then snaps back to normal, establishing that the story can get that dark, but it won't stay that dark for long. Stakes cul-de-sac. I like that. This is how you can smoothly get unexpectedly dark single episodes of otherwise mostly lighthearted stories without it being ridiculously jarring. If the level of danger experienced in the one-shot Extreme Peril arc is in line with the level of danger threatened by the rest of the story, it's not completely story-breaking, it's just pleasantly tense. And that's kind of a narrow balance to strike. Tone armor is a mostly invisible element of storytelling that I frankly have never seen anyone directly discuss, but it plays a huge role in how stories feel and what a writer can do with them without dis lodging or confusing their audience. Breaking a story's established tone armor is always an impactful moment. The first time we see a character bleed or break a bone or just straight up die is the first time the story proves it's willing to go there and could potentially go there, go there again. again. But breaking yeah. the tone too violently risks relinquishing the story over into the joint custody of comedy and tragedy. Thus far, we've really only talked about stories that break their tone armor in relatively small ways, going from no blood to one drop of blood, or threatening Armageddon to taste testing Armageddon, or this character has been successfully protecting us to the character's gone the character's and the things gone, we were protecting yeah. us from are actually really bad. Shifts that are one step outside the established tonal range. That's because if a story breaks its own tone armor by going from zero to a hundred, it's not darkly impactful, it's jarringly hilarious. Oh, characters experiencing yeah. realistic consequences from cartoonish violence is a common dark joke. Genre bending lighthearted cartoon characters into dark and gory scenarios is used for instant shock factor. Everyone makes fun of the CW for taking colorful kids media and sexing it up for live action and whatever the hell else they did with Riverdale before they finally let it die because oh, that God. kind of shift is intrinsically funny. Everyone took oh, the piss God. out of Sonic Forces when they dropped this little chestnut. Hell, just transposing oh. wacky animated violence into the context of a live action adaptation can take a fight scene from feeling wacky to feeling uncomfortably visceral. When tone armor is broken, the first thing it does is make the audience feel unsafe. There was previously a narrow band of conceivable stakes that the story stayed within the boundaries of and breaking the tone armor breaches those borders, and that means the audience no longer knows what to expect. The characters are in danger in a way they weren't before. That kind of subversion of expectations can be played up for tragedy, comedy, or both. <laughs> Blood but Force drama exists too far now, if right? The intent is to keep the audience in the story. If you break the rules too hard, the audience gets jarred loose and stops being invested because they have no idea what to expect anymore. There's a reason it's inherently hilarious to consider where you would put a single. Wait, que a question for the class. Lord of the Rings is, is rated PG-13 and as such is allowed one <laughs> Where would you put it? <laughs> 
reason it's inherently hilarious to consider where you would put a single F-bomb in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. No matter where it goes, it will never fit the tone. That's why it's funny. Trying to do it seriously would be like ice skating uphill. If you break the invisible rules that have been holding the story in shape this whole time, sometimes all the audience can do is laugh and then disinvest. Because once the punchline is over, the audience leaves. So, yeah. I'll be honest, I've done some weird trope talks. This is probably the first one where I was like, man, I hope, I hope any of this makes sense. <laughs> no, but trust me, it has. <laughs> Putting one F-bomb in Lord of the Rings. Oh, God. I mean, I remember seeing those things, like, where would you put, like, the one F-bomb and so-and-so, but, like, I never even thought of putting it into Lord of the Rings before. I didn't even know it was technically PG-13. <sighs> oh, God. It, again, this is the sort of stuff that, like, this is the, the reason I love watching OSP is just because specifically Red is so good at putting these things uh, like get tropes for like for lack of a better term because you know that's what this, this, this series is called but like putting these tropes that you know into words specifically the ones that like we all kind of know about but never really think about like you know, tone armor. Nobody's ever said anything or even called anything tone armor before this video, I'm pretty sure. So as always, original video will be linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the day. And if you've been liking the stuff that I've been putting out, whether it's reaction or Let's Play, I would very much like it if you could take a minute and just subscribe to my channel. It would mean the world to me. So yeah, with all that out of the way, I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.